Right, so here we have it, Marcel Kittel's power file and race performance is analyzed in the Tour de France from 2013 uh, to 2016. It's pretty exciting. I'm G'd up. I'm ready to have a little analysis and go through the paper with you. So without further ado, let's get into it. So first of all, just the abstract, basically to describe the intensity, load and performance characteristics. A lot of scientific speak, a lot of it isn't really too interesting, but we'll go through the key things. So they basically just want to analyze like what the difference between the flat stages, the mountain stages, the semi-mountainous stages and the TTs. But obviously, you know, a lot of the conclusions aren't really groundbreaking. It's like, oh, it's more intense than a TT than a flat stage. So, well, yeah, obviously. Um, but we can get some interesting things about Kittel. So uh, this is all about Kittel. So it's just saying about the kilojoules per day. Average is 4,000, which isn't actually that high, really. Um, it's not crazy high. And it's just saying, you know, it's about how how it all is to do with the stages. Again, not too exciting. This is the participant, which obviously Marcel Kittel Um at one point, apparently won 20% of his mass start races. Then they have the power meters, obviously, SRM or 4IIIIIA. Um, so, yeah, if we if we go through, they basically define it by Coggins power. So zone one, less than 55%. Zone two, 56 to 75. Um, zone three, obviously, is like tempo. Um, and then, obviously, all the rest, like threshold, VO2. And the reason they chose zone five, which is just 106% above, was they just said that above that is so small, there's no real point, like, you know, Pinnicketing if it's anaerobic or not. Um, the FTP was determined as 95% the highest 20 minute power. Um, and these are some interesting numbers. So his FTP was like 430, which is 4.8 watts per kilo, uh, 442, 4.9, and 431, 4.9, and 438. So you can basically see that if we put him on a hill climb, 20 minute max effort, he's not he's not well beaten. Surprising that is. But like really not that well beaten, like as in most amateurs could be like most amateurs would have like an FTP of over five watts per kilo if they're like actually try um, and train a decent amount. So then you're like, he's not that good. However, I would caveat that by saying when you're 90 kilos, unless it's like a 9% grid, like he'd beat me if we both did five watts per kilo, let's say, or 5.2, or whatever, for like 20 minutes, he would beat me because I weigh less. And so, like, obviously, more watts is just better. But even so, it's not actually that crazy numbers and probably is why he doesn't always get to the end of the tour in top condition because his watts per kilo aren't that good. So threshold, not even five watts per kilo, gets you around the Tour de France. But you do have to weigh 90 kilos, so it's like... And um, with response to that, he also said that if he weighed lighter, he would have done better in the mountain stages, but he would have done worse in the sprint stages. So obviously that makes sense. Uh, his you know, his goal is obviously to, to win sprints. It's not to get around Tour de France stages. You can see here he was weighing 90 kilos, which is huge for a cyclist in, in reality. Um, you know, if you're a track cyclist, fair enough. But for him to actually weigh 90 kilos and have a five watt per kilo FTP is mad. Like, that is really, really mad. Because, like, you know, if you weigh 60 kilos, having a 5 watt per kilo FTP is obviously way less impressive than when you're 90. Um, if we look at the results, he won a lot of the, uh, a lot of stages. Um, a lot of this stuff I don't really find is too interesting. It's just saying, like, how much time they spend in each zone. But it doesn't really, like, it doesn't say much. Like, there was no difference found for distance and duration between the mountain passes. I don't know. I don't really find any of this too interesting. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep scrolling down. Um, uh, and then, yeah, it just is basically saying about the stress. Um, but if we go down to the, this is the more exciting thing, uh, which is just the tables, obviously more easy to analyze as well. Uh, but you can see that average distance, mean power output. It's not actually crazy high. I don't know if this is normalized or not. I assume not. Um, so it's probably a little bit higher normalized. But anyway, you can see like 260 is not, not crazy. Um, and you can see it's also done in watts per kilo, which again, I, I don't think is super interesting. Kilojoules, like 4,000 kilojoules a day. Again, you know, the biggest he had was 7,000. I guess the smallest he had was 500, would have been like a TT. And, and a 6,000 kilojoule day is, is huge as well. And you can also see kilojoules per kilometer as well, which probably is quite a good indication of how hard the race is, because obviously more kilojoules you're putting out, the more, like the harder it is pretty much. Um, then if we look at the flat, uh, medium mountains, uh, mountains and TTs, you can obviously see, see the average distances. Also, his mean power output. So you can see in the TTs, he takes it very easy. Only like, you know, 384 watts. I believe this 500 watt one would have probably been in like the prologue of the 2015 Tour de France, which Rowan Dennis won, I think. I think that's when it would have been. Uh, I don't think there was another short one like that. Because um, he he was probably having a go because he thought maybe I'd get the leader's jersey, you know, next couple stages. Um, but yeah, 500 watts is pretty solid. And then again, obviously, kilojoules per kilometer, obviously highest in the TT. Uh, nothing too rocket science. And then you can see towards like the the, cl the climbing uh, stages, um, you can see that his mean power output is again, not crazy, like 4.3, 4.6, which to be honest, like most people can do. 
Um, so I guess the point is, is like it's not crazy to get around the tour if you weigh 90 kilos and have a big FTP. Um, and then these are some of the max sprint stages, you know, like 2000 watts. But we're going to get more into that into the next study. So this is the next study, um, which I think is, in my opinion, a lot more interesting. It's about sprint tactics, but it does it in like a scientific way, which I quite like. Because obviously, most of the time when people talk about tactics, they talk more about like, you know, oh, he moved up there, he moved up this. But this is very like data driven, which I think is, is an interesting way to go through it. Um, so the preamble here is pretty much the same, but he's basically just saying the results. He's won 14 out of the 21 sprints. Um, and then it just shows that like a quick step, he was further back compared to Shimano, um, which is obviously was the team before, uh, before quick step when he joined them. Uh, so 2013, 2014. And, you know, there's just different, uh, different energies, uh, just sort of different energy requirements, depending on where he is due to the drafting effect. Um, so you can see here some of the, some of the sprint numbers are pretty, pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, just more, more sort of preamble, which I, I don't know why they always have it. Um, but we do get to see some of his numbers, I think, that come out um, about his best 20 minute powers, which I think were like 490 or something mental. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, so his best 20 minute powers were like 450, 465, 450 and 460, which is mad, um, mad. And uh, I guess it explains why he was a junior individual time trial champion, because back then he was probably a lot smaller and still had mad watts. Um, but yeah, you can sort of see that their aerobic capacity is still huge because you think like track sprinters are doing like 2500 watts maybe 2600 but then they're not their ftp is like nowhere near five like let's be honest because otherwise if it was they'd be getting around uh races and trying to win um so again if we look at the results this is the most exciting thing um and it's all just to do with like the the speed and the cadence that they have so generally have 53 11 the cadence is quite low like max 120 i thought was was, was quite low actually um and also if we look at the team tactics, this is where it's quite interesting. So it's just saying that the power output um, was actually higher at quick step. Um, and it's not really too surprising because he'd often come from the back and then come round, which obviously was different to compare to, uh, to Shimano, where he generally stayed, as they say here, at the front. But then obviously that means you're putting more energy because you get less of a draft. It says somewhere here that um, you get about 80% of the draft um, we look at the team tactics here so it says here team shimano was to ride the last three or two kilometers in the front um while quick steps he'd hide further back and if we look here it says that um in fourth position in sprint train will release result in a power output reduction of 53 percent while if he was like fourth position in the peloton then it's going to be like 83 percent so you can see like by being further back he's going to save a lot more energy but then you have to move up in the last 30 seconds as it says here and so then the last 30 seconds was higher so like 900 watts from 30 to 15 seconds, followed by 1370 during the final 15 seconds. And that's the two differences. And then it again says that the obviously there's more risk about being boxed in, etc. But it's quite an interesting thought that, you know, like which way is better. It probably depends on the type of sprint you are. If you've just got a fat threshold like Kittle does, being on the front probably isn't as much of an issue. Well, maybe doing those two surges is quite hard. Well, if you're someone smaller like Kokar, you really want to, you know, surf in a peloton and then launch it towards the end, because you might your acceleration is probably quite good. You probably have like a double kick on you, um, and that's sort of the tactic you want to be. Um, in terms of winning or losing, um, again, I don't think it's it's too crazy, um, but they did say that basically, like, the further up you are, obviously, there's a there's a high chance of you winning. Um, and then also they would compare Kittle to some other riders using Watts per kilo, which I don't think is the most relevant metric, because obviously, okay, Kittle's going to have more Watts per kilo, um, sorry, like less watts per kilo compared to a smaller rider because he's just doing more absolute power. So I don't, don't think it's the best way of comparing. Um, and they're saying like professional sprinters are worse than Kittle, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily see that this is the best way of doing it. Then the limitations, obviously, just the power meters and all the rest of it. Uh, but if we go back to my favorite little thing at the end, which is always the tables, and this is really where you get to see like the best numbers that he does. So like, you know, one second power output is like only seventeen hundred. Like, okay, he reaches a peak of like eighteen seventy eight. Um, but it's, it's it's not absolutely like bonkers compared to what you could do fresh. But then having said that, compared to like Viviani, they hit like 13, 14 max. That's what Cav says. He doesn't hit like 1800 watts. So that's the difference. It's like Kittle hits stupid numbers, but then he's not very aero. He's just a big unit. Um, and then the five second power again is really a lot higher than what I see. If you look at those Velon data, the Giro, they normally only do like a thousand watts for 10 seconds, which obviously doesn't sound that impressive. But after the high... You know, the last five kilometers is probably ridden a normalized of 400 or something. So that's why it's um, it's pretty hard. 
Um, if we look at the whole sprint, um, you know, it's pretty consistent year to year that, you know, you need about 1400 watts for Kittle, which obviously compared to his weight and arrow, which is probably the best way of doing it. If we did watts per CDA, that's the sort of thing you need to do, 1400 watts by whatever CDA is. Um, and that's the sort of things you need to do. His sprint time is also very close, average. Obviously, some shorter, some longer. The, the, the variance in some of them is quite large. But even so, like, 13 seconds seems to be the one average speed, 66 kilometers an hour. And again, average cadence, not crazy high. Not as high as Cav, that's for sure. Um, and then if we just look at, like, where they were in terms of positioning, um, so you can see, like, 10 minutes to go. Um, I think... In terms of like 0 0.4 plus or minus 5, I don't really understand that and I didn't really seem to explain it or maybe I just missed it. So if you do know what that means, then let me know because I don't really understand how you could be 0 0.1 from the front. Um, but anyway, that is what it seems to be. But you can see like, and just in terms of like where he is on average, uh, in terms of the positioning, you can see like quick step, he definitely held back. He was a lot um, further away um, than he was for Shimano. And then keep scrolling down, and then you can just see, like, I guess where he was in terms of, sorry, the position here. I think this seems to be a better way, but, like, where he was in terms of his teammates as well. So if he was further back or closer. And then we can also see here, which I think is probably one of the most useful things, is actually the graph of, like, his numbers. So you can see, like, you know, from the time from second, so obviously it starts at three minutes to go. You can see it's, like, it's very stochastic, obviously, to be expected. Um... But there's not much freewheeling, really. It doesn't really go below 200 watts that often, which maybe you would. But you can also see, like, the general general rise. Um, and this thing here is, like, 500 watts for the last 30 seconds. Isn't Maybe not as high as I thought it was going to be. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And then it's and then this last bit is, like, between 30 and 10 is, like, 784 watts. Which I guess is really where it starts to hurt. Because, like, that's, you know, you're doing... A lot of power before you even get to the sprint and then the last bit is 1400 so it's like sort of a ramp test you can see here it looks pretty pretty ramp test up um but yeah you can see from like sort of three minutes on it's like 321 versus 392 and you can see that obviously shimano is a lot higher like 70 watts higher is, is pretty pretty conclusive um and then obviously here you, again you can see if he's won or lost um depending on where he was so generally when he won um which is in the black or zoom in a little bit because i think it's quite hard to see otherwise so if you see the the dotted line is where he where he lost, um, and generally that seems to be maybe higher like here, um, and probably I guess just higher because he's more out of position, so he's trying to get through. But then lower here, and also I guess lower at the end, which does make sense because he was more tired. Um, but it was also weird that it's lower here. So you think when he lost, he was probably too far back in the peloton, just cruising like oh, I can't move up, can't move up. And then when he could move up, he launched it a lot more, which is why his numbers are higher. Um, but then the, the lower hits, it's hard, it's hard to say, I guess, unless you watched all of them. But I think the Argos versus Quick Step is very interesting. That, like, from minute two to minute three to minute two, it's 70 watts higher on Shimano, which does show that, like, you have to be very, very strong. Like, if that was Kittle, not Kittle, someone else whose threshold, like, Kokar, like, threshold is probably, like, 370, let's say, 390, maybe. Like, that's a, so much harder. And obviously, you know, it's not smooth either. Um, that's a lot harder. And then here again, you can see quick step though is again, like 50, 60 watts lower. Um, and it's lower all the time until basically the very end here where like quick step finally gets, starts to get a bit higher here where it's 900 watts for the last 10 seconds instead of 654. And again, as I said before, that just depends on your sprint style. Um, but I think in general, it also like Depends how strong the lead out riders are. Like I think maybe back in the day when Argos were there, like they just had the best lead out so they could do that. But I think if Quickstep tried it, like, okay, he'd save slightly more energy here. But then at the same time, I think like they just wouldn't have a strong enough rider. So it'd get to the end and he'd just be exposed. So I think, you know, that's obviously something to think about. Um, and then we can also see his power output maximum for five seconds um, among the different stages. Um, and I don't, I guess, you know, the 10 to five minute, things seems like it it stays similar but probably does decrease across the days in the Tour de France um like it's obviously getting easier um but it's max five seconds just seems to get better and better which is again interesting um and then yeah that's that's pretty much it so anyway I hope you did enjoy this video um super interesting to see people's power data I like it I try and do that on Froome stuff like I mean imagine yeah it's basically just try and write a paper on Froome's data but I just make videos instead but it's actually interesting to see someone who knows what's doing. I'll link both of these below so you can see them. They're free to view, which is really, really good. Um, and yeah, so anyway, cheers for watching. Hope you enjoy this video and I will see you in the next one.